Welcome to lesson number 12, our final lesson in the study on the book of Revelation. We are starting today with chapter 19, verse 11, and we'll go all the way to the end of the book of Revelation, the end of chapter 2. Then I saw heaven opened, and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judge and judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name inscribed that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, wearing fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name inscribed, King of kings and Lord of lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly in mid-heaven, Come, gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of the mighty, the flesh of the horses and their riders, flesh of all, both free and slave, both small and great. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against the rider on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured. And uh, sorry, and with it the false prophet who had performed in its presence the signs by which he deceives those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were killed by the sword of the rider on the horse, the sword that came from his mouth, and all the birds were gorged on their flesh. We come now to the concluding section of Revelation. We've had cycles of rebellion, judgment, and praise. Judgment has been pronounced in different ways and in different degrees and to different people, although the judgment is always upon the unfaithful, but the different ones of those who are unfaithful. Repentance has been offered time and time again, but the final full and complete judgment is now at hand as is the coming of the new Jerusalem, the full and final victory of God. Here what happens is heaven opens, not just a gate, not just a door, as in other times, not just a, a door of the temple, but all of heaven is opened. And out of, that, um, out of that opening comes the rider on the white horse. Now if you remember, we've encountered a white horse before. It was the first seal that contained the rider on the white horse. And you may remember the different viewpoints about, about the identity of that rider. Uh, and, and now I come down on the idea that the rider is Christ himself, the Son of Man. I outlined those reasons in lesson number six if you want to go and refresh your memory. Part of that reason going all the way back then is actually part of the uh, validation, I think, is what we see here in chapter 19 with the reappearance of this rider on the white horse. First of all, the exact same language of introduction is used in uh, there in chapter 6 with the opening of the first seal that it is here in 1911. The writer gives his name as faithful and true, which is the name Jesus gives himself in the letter to Laodicea. There are other similarities that involve the diadems, the robe dipped in blood, the word of God, the sword coming out of his mouth, the eyes that are flames of fire, and that goes all the way back actually to chapter 1 and that initial vision that John has of the Son of Man. The iron rod that is there, the wine press. He is the one who operates the wine press, who treads on the wine and who exacts that judgment. It says also though that he has a name inscribed on his forehead that no one knows. And that can be a little confusing at first because after all if the writer has already been named faithful and true, how can he have a name that no one knows? The name inscribed on his forehead is a name that no one knows because the character and the nature of the Son of Man cannot be contained or distilled down to one name or one description, not even faithful and true. There's, there's an unknowable depth, you see, and a mystery to the Son of Man because God cannot and God will not be contained by our limited understanding 
uh, and, and our limited viewpoint. We then move on to look at a name that he is given that's inscribed on that thigh, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And, and really that relates all the way back to the time of the number 666. Remember in that uh, study, uh, in that lesson, I talked about the practice of gematria and how the name of Nero um, corresponds to the number 666. If we were to apply that same practice of gematria to the name inscribed on the white rider that said it's, it's on his um, robe and on his thigh, the King of Kings and the Lords of Lords, the name that you get in Greek when you add it up, the number adds up to 777. So just as 666 is, is a number of, of kind of perfect evil, 777 is a number of perfect good. It's a number of perfect completion. So the one who is perfect good is about to conquer the force of the dragon, the beast, and the image of the beast who are pure evil. What comes at hand now and is at hand is the completion of the battle first mentioned in chapter 16 and 17. In, in preparation for that, the angel summons the birds as part of that pronouncement that the forces of evil are about to be destroyed. And we have here kind of a graphic image about the saying that the birds are going to gorge on the flesh of all of those uh, people. But it's, uh, those, but it's a, a symbol of just kind of the magnitude of, about, of what is about to happen as all of these are going to feast on the destruction of the beast and all who follow him. So then the armies of the dragon and the beast and the one that bears that image, they all um, uh, gather together and the kings of the army uh, gather to make war against the rider on the white horse and the army. And just as they, when they gather back at Armageddon, a great battle is expected. There's anticipation there. And I don't know about you, but, but in kind of my imagination, a way of picturing that throughout most of my life, I picture this great battle to concern after, to come after all we hear about the battle of Armageddon. I'm a big fan of the Lord of the Rings books and movies. I first read the books when I was 13 years old. And I remember when I found out that they were going to, it was going to come onto the big screen. I couldn't wait, and I was always one of the first people there. In the last movie, The Return of the King, uh, if you saw it, if you remember, there's this Armageddon-like battle. Forces, good and evil, in every direction, spread out on this huge plain as far as the eye can see. And this massive and amazing battle scene takes place of all sorts of different creatures, all sorts of different animals, all sorts of, of different beasts, uh, along with uh, humans. And that's no surprise because Tolkien used a lot of Christian imagery and symbolism in these books. And in some ways, I think he drew up the gathering of this army um, on this final battle in the book, The Return of the King, as, and, and kind of drew upon this from Armageddon as maybe inspiration for that battle. But have you noticed something? That there's a major difference between that image that we so often have and, and I've seen depicted in, in other ways as well and what is actually in Scripture. Did you catch what the difference is? In this vision, there's never actually any battle that occurs. They gather. There's this anticipation. The dragon, the beast, and the one that bears its image on one side and all those army, those kings of the earth, and the captains and all those one. And on the other side, you have the rider on the white horse and the angels and the army and all of his army that's there. But what happens next? The beast and the false prophet are captured and they're thrown into the lake of fire alive. A fire that burns with sulfur, another callback, if you will, to um, Sodom and Gomorrah, as well as other references that talk about that total destruction that's coming by God. The beast and the, the false prophet are still alive in that lake of fire. And those who follow the beast and the false prophet are then killed by the rider on the white horse with that sword that comes out of his mouth. And those are, that's where the birds are there then to gorge on the dead flesh of those killed. The army uh, of the Son of Man doesn't battle. Not only do none of the forces of evil battle, the army of the Son of Man doesn't battle either. They're not needed because all are destroyed by that sword that comes out of the mouth of the rider on the white horse who is the Son of Man. You see, the Son of Man conquers by His might 
alone, although all of those who are faithful and all those who follow him benefit from that victory. Like the other parts of this vision, there's a a clear and, and central message there. And that's that God triumphs over the forces of evil, no matter how big and powerful they may be. Those who have caused such wanton havoc and destruction, those who have tormented and killed God's faithful, are now themselves irreversibly destroyed. We then move on to chapter 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. He seized the dragon that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and locked and sealed it over him so that he would deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be let out for a little while. Then I saw thrones and those seated on them were given authority to judge. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony to Jesus and for the word of God. They had not worshiped the beast nor its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with Him for a thousand years. Now, where the beast and the, whereas the beast and the false prophet have been judged, now it is the dragon. It is Satan's turn. The angel has a key, has a chain with which he binds Satan. And notice who it is that holds the key to the bottomless pit. It's not Satan who holds the key to that bottomless pit where he dwells. It is the angel who holds that key. It's a reminder that God is the one who is sovereign over all creation. We sometimes think about the about there being this great battle between God and Satan as if there is some sort of equivalency between them, all good on one side and all evil on the other. But notice that nowhere in this vision throughout the entire book of Revelation and really nowhere in Scripture is Satan depicted as equal with, with God. Satan is powerless before God. Satan may have rebelled against God, but Satan is powerless uh, against God. God is sovereign. God is in total control holds the key to that bottomless pit which contains satan satan is bound for a thousand years uh, that demonstration of god's control now i'm not going to spend a lot of time frankly on the thousand years a lot has been made of it and people try to figure out uh what's going to happen during the thousand years what's going to happen right before the thousand years what's going to happen right after the thousand years i really think that that is kind of uh trying to find something that really john isn't talking about I really think that the number 1,000 years is like other numbers in uh, Revelation. It's more symbolic. The number 10 we've seen over and over again is a number of completion, and and uh, and a thousand is a common multiple uh, in this as as well. As is uh, 10 being a multiple, 100 being a multiple, which we've seen at uh, other times. You see, the point is not that there will literally be a thousand years in which Satan is bound, and then part of what we try to do in our modern times is is set about trying to figure out how far into that time period we are right now and maybe when that's going to come and when it's going to start. No, the overarching message is that there will be, in God's timing, a period of binding of Satan, followed by a short period of time in which Satan is loosed and for that short period of time wreaks havoc and destruction and death and chaos one more time because after that time comes the full and final judgment of God. It's another reminder for us not to get caught up in the literal and chronological time reference but to see how the time and their relationship to each other fits into God's timing, fits into God's perfect will and plan. Satan, in other words, will be bound for a length of God's determination, a time that is of completion for God, excuse me. He will be loosed for a short period of time, and then Satan will be judged and will be no more, and we'll see what happens to Satan in just a minute. Those who were killed for their faithfulness will reign with God during this time of the binding of Satan. It talks about those that have been beheaded, and beheading is mentioned specifically probably because it was the most common means of execution for those who were killed for their faith and the testimony of Jesus. 
not that it was meant to exclude people who may have died for their faith by other means. There's a reference to the second death, and it's a death other than the physical death. It refers to that spiritual death, that eternal torment for those who are judged unfaithful to God. Those who remain faithful, you see, have no fear for the second death because we have everlasting life. If we move on uh, now uh, in the midst of that, uh, we look at uh, chapter 20, verses 7 through 10. When the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations of the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, in order to gather them for battle. They are as numerous as the sands of the sea. They marched up over the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. And fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophets were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. You see, for this short period of time, Satan is released and continues that deception. But he still cannot escape God's judgment. And ultimately, he is released in order to prove himself once again unworthy and released in order to eventually then be judged. We have the reference to Gog and Magog, which are references to the book of evil and, and symbolize that evil. And in this context, that Gog and Magog are equated with, uh, with Rome. Of course, there's a gathering again for a battle, but notice that once again, no battle is actually fought. Instead, fire comes from heaven and consumes those who are evil. If we continue on in chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, Then I saw a great white throne and the one who sat on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before the throne, and books were open. And then also another book was opened, the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And they all were judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. You see, there are these books that are open, and one of them are, is where folks are judged according to their works. And in any who are judged according to their works, judged according to their deeds, are found to be not worthy. Anytime we are judged according to our works, we are found um, unworthy and we fall short. Because it's a reminder that we are not saved by our works. Rather, we are saved by faith through, uh, th by, by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And that's why our name is written not in the book of works or the book of deeds. Our name is written in the book of life. Any who come to Christ, any who accept Christ on faith, any who accept Him and proclaim Him as Savior and Lord, then are judged not by those works and judged and thrown into the lake of fire, but are saved and do not experience that second death, but experience that everlasting uh, life. The lake of fire is for all those who, despite their opportunities to repent, still hold on to their allegiance to Satan. Notice here then also the last enemy to die is death itself. In the Garden of Eden, you see, God, uh, death was not part of God's original intent. It's introduced due to our sin and our rebellion, our desire to be like God. But you see, however, there is no death for those whose lives are in Christ because salvation in Christ leads to ever resurrection to everlasting life. We then move on to chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I'm making all things new. Also, he said, write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. 
Then he said to me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Those who conquer will inherit these things, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the, the faithless, the polluted, the murderers, the fornicators, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Now, I'm not going to go through this bit by bit. Um, we're going to take more of that overview. But notice those different things. The, the names given to God, I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the, the, the eternal uh, waters of life, those springs of life that are, are given that he talks about in the letters to the uh, seven churches. Um, it is done. It is finished. God has completed what he is doing. You see, John is not describing here a literal kind of physical replacement of a new heaven and earth uh, here as much as he is describing what that eternal relationship with God will look like. All of those forces of evil and chaos, those that dwell in the sea are no more because the sea is no more. The consequences of evil are no more because evil has been defeated and is no more. There's no more death. There's no more grief, no more mourning. John gives in this new heaven and new earth and the descent of the new Jerusalem this mixed metaphor, if you will, of the holy city and the bridal imagery as well. But that also kind of fits uh, because those have been two of the most dominant images in Revelation for that uh, relationship of God to God's faithful. The loud voice declares God's dwelling among the people. That dwelling is the same as the word tent is used in other parts of the Bible. It refers to that tabernacle in the wilderness where the presence of God dwelled with the people when they wandered for those 40 years in the wilderness. But you see, there's also a reference to the glory of God that is also there, that's part of that dwelling there in the tabernacle, that Shekinah of God, that glory of God seen in the new heaven and the new earth that now covers not just a part, but covers all of the earth. And whereas the earth is once a seen as a place of rebellion and chaos now the earth is filled with God's glory and those former things are no more but let's also be clear what this vision demonstrates which is that um, this scene this vision is this image is not one of a universalist salvation not everyone experiences the blessedness of the new heaven and the new earth those who have continued to be unfaithful, who have blasphemed God in word and deed, they are thrown into the lake of fire and they experience the second death, the spiritual death, that ultimate separation from God. We continue on in chapter 21, starting with verse 9. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And in the Spirit he carried me away to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It has the glory of God and a radiance like a very rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It has a great high wall with twelve gates, and at the, twelve, at the gates twelve angels, and on the gates are inscribed the names of the twelve tribes of the Israelites. And on the east gate, on the east three gates, and on the north three gates, and on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city has twelve foundations, and on them are the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked to me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod 1,500 miles, its length and width and height are equal. He also measured it, its wall 144 cubits by human measurement which the angel was using. The wall is built of jasper while the city is pure gold, clear as glass. The foundations of the wall of the city are adorned with every jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth cornelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth uh, chrysoprase, the eleventh uh, jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates are twelve pearls, and each of the gates is a single pearl. And the street of the city is pure gold, transparent as glass. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. 
The nations will walk by its light and the kings of earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day and there will be no night there. People will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will enter it, nor anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. The angel then shows, you see, uh, John the new Jerusalem. The angel that shows John this new Jerusalem is the same one who in chapter 17 shows him the harlot of Babylon. The contrast is impossible to ignore between perfect evil and chaos and perfect good and peace seen here. When we look at the dimensions, we see that it forms a cube. It's the same lit length and width and height. And that number is, uh, and that measurement, the same being there, is how the Holy of Holies is described. The Holy of Holies, you remember, being that innermost sanctum of the temple, the place of God's dwelling, where only the high priest entered, and then only one day a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. In other words, there's now no separation between the secular and the sacred, between the profane and the holy. Every space is holy. Every space is now infused with the presence of the glory of God. I won't go bit by bit and and piece by piece with all the instances of the number 12, but notice that it's used over and over again, denoting the holiness of the place with the gates, the guardian angels, the foundations which contain the name of the apostles, the names of the Israelites. Each edge of the city has 12,000 people, and there are 12 edges, which adds up to 144,000, which is, you remember the number, uh, the symbolic number for the totality of God's faithful people. The stones are all precious gemstones, and while there have been a, a, a lot of different interpretations on the meaning of those specific stones, I think that overarching message is that this is something of surpassing value, incalculable value of the new heaven and the new earth. There's no need for a temple to hold God's dwelling because God's dwelling is everywhere. There's no more night, no more darkness. All is light, and that light is, not just sent by, the light is that Lamb of God. And notice that only those who are holy, only those who are obedient to God may enter. But no matter where they're from, all nations, the gift, the glory, and the honor of all the nations, they may bring in that holiness of the people. The gates are always open to the faithful servant of God, and nothing that is unclean is allowed into the new heaven and the new earth. We continue on to chapter 22 as we near the end. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as the crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Through the middle of the street of the city, on either side of the river is the tree of life with twelve kinds of fruit producing its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Nothing accursed will be found there any more. But the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads, and there will be no more night. They need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. And he said to me, These words are trustworthy and true, for the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must next, what, what must soon take place. See, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your comrades, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. In multiple places in the Old Testament and other Jewish writings as well, the tree of life is a symbol of the restoration of God's kingdom, the complete restoration, the plentiful food, the healing of the nations. The tree, the water, the fruit, and the leaves all demonstrate abundance. They demonstrate healing. They demonstrate a restoration to the fullness of life. The faithful have the name of God on their foreheads. They can see God, and that's significant as well because in this day and time it was believed that if someone saw the face of God directly, they would die. When Moses wanted to see God's face, God said, No, you cannot do that. I'm too holy. So he lets him see his back. Isaiah in his vision in the temple is amazed because he does look upon God and lives. He's afraid that he's about to die. 
several different times, maybe most familiarly with the shepherds and with um, the women at the tomb. They are terrified when they are in the presence of those angels because they recognize they're in the presence of holiness and they know and are afraid that they may die. And in each instance, the angel says, do not be afraid. One of those most powerful aspects of the transfiguration that happens with Peter, James, and John is that they see Christ transfigured and they do not die. Here, all creation, not just a few privileged people, all creation looks upon the face of God. All are made well. The holiness and glory and power and the grace of God are seen in full measure. Again, John is overcome and starts to bow before the angel, but he says to him once again, No, I'm only a servant of God like you. Worship only God. And he said to me, this is uh, moving to chapter 22, verses 10 through 11. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophets of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy, excuse me, still be holy. See, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me to repay according to everyone's work. I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they will have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and fornicators and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. It is I, Jesus, who sent my angel to you with this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let everyone who hears say, Come, and let everyone who is thirsty come. Let everyone who wishes to take the water of life as a gift. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of this book of the prophecy, God will grant God will take away that person's share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. The one who identifies these things says, Surely I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all the saints. Amen. Again, I won't go through every piece of that. Um, just for sake of time, but notice over and over again those same images, the calling out of who Christ is, who is welcome into that holy city, who may enter the gates, who is outside those gates. One thing I do want to talk about a bit is that John is told not to seal up the words of the prophecy of this book. The commandment to not seal up these words means that the time, as John is told, is near. But as is the case throughout this vision, that the time is near does not refer to a chronological time as, as if we should expect or think that it's going to have or try to figure out when that time is going to be. Rather, the time is near is another reference to God's timing, the timing of God's will, plan, and purpose. It's that kairos time, that perfect timing of God. And it's impossible for us to figure out and worthless for us to even try. I like how Dr. Robert, Robert Mulholland talks, makes this strong point about the commandment to not seal up the prophecy and thinking about how we can look at that and interpret that today. He writes these words, quote, For the city of New Jerusalem, the consummation is always imminent. We are to live as, as, as if each moment is the last. This does not mean abandoning the future, nor does it mean there is no need to plan ahead. It means living in such radical obedience to God each moment that should the Lord return, we are not surprised or dismayed, but experience the consummation of our own faithfulness in God's consummation. Now in some ways, as John notes throughout this vision, that consummation of God's kingdom has already occurred through the cross. But it's also the case that that full and final and complete consummation is yet to come at some point of God's timing and choosing. One last time, we see here that there are those who are not part of the new Jerusalem. Those who are not part of the new heaven and the new earth due to their allegiance to the dragon. These different behaviors mentioned there um, reflect that consistent attitude of heart and mind shown by those who cast their lot 
with fallen Babylon and who are still determined to do so. But notice that fallen Babylon in, in reality is no more. There is the holy city of the new Jerusalem and only those who are faithful and holy may enter. Now as I conclude this lesson and really this study overall, um, one of the things that I've tried to do throughout these lessons is operate from the viewpoint that this revelation of Jesus to John is not about trying to figure out exactly when or how the end times will come. Not to be looking for all sorts of signs in our modern day world to try to figure out and connect them with something there in Revelation. That revelation is not some secret, uh, a book of secret code to be unlocked to figure out a timeline for the return of Christ. But instead, that revelation is a reminder to all who suffer anywhere and is a reminder to those of us um, uh, who do not uh, suffer persecution that God is ultimately in control, that God has brought about the victory uh, on the cross through Jesus Christ, that even those forces of evil that can sometimes look so dominant and strong and unstoppable are in fact weak and temporary and that God's reign will endure forever. I like the way Dr. Mickey Efert um, puts it to describe why this way of looking at uh, this vision and this revelation is ultimately uh, the preferred way to approach this book. When um, in, the other, in other ways, the, uh, the other way of looking at it uh, may seem a little more fun or, or exciting. And he writes these words, quote, Many express the reaction, Is that all? when learning what the book actually says in contrast to the way it's been so often dramatically presented. What John taught us in Revelation may not be as dramatic as some has have led us to believe, but what he taught us is much more realistic and in line with other biblical teaching. It is, after all, not insignificant to learn that God is in control of all creation, that God will win the final victory over evil, that those who are faithful will not have died in vain, and that their witness is indeed part of God's victory, end quote. He goes on to note that for those of us who have, um, uh, for those who rather, for those people who have experienced persecution for their faith in this world, they read Revelation differently than those of us, and particularly like in America and other places, uh, than those of us who have not experienced persecution for our faith. He notes that maybe the part of the desire to make Revelation so dramatic and exciting for us Christians in America is that we don't know what it's like to be persecuted. But he goes on to note that for those who have been persecuted and tortured for their faith, for their testimony of the witness of Jesus, they understand the relief. They understand the victory. They understand the joy of a new age that comes when that persecution is ended, when they are free to worship God, or when they experience uh, that first and that, uh, that resurrection to everlasting life, particularly when that persecution comes to an end. I want to conclude with this. For many years, I was reluctant to delve too deep into Revelation. I allowed the popular kind of left-behind Darbyist view to keep me from exploring uh, the vision beyond mainly those that part of the letters to the seven churches and the passage about the new heaven and the new earth. But I'm glad, and I want to say a word of gratitude to those uh, who kept urging me to do a study on this and who I finally listened to them. Because in the process, I gained a new appreciation for the richness and depth of this revelation of Jesus to John. Not by trying to decipher some ancient mystery like James Bond decoding a, a, a message, a cryptic message meant only for him, but rather in the clear and persistent message that is for all people, for all time, that God's sovereignty is over all, that the forces of evil and death are ultimately powerless in light of God's glory and power. That God is a merciful God who desires for His creation to repent, but that God is also just. I was reminded in this uh, going throughout Revelation that unholiness, and heard that message, we all heard that message very clearly, that unholiness cannot stand in the face of holiness. So that when times come in my own life to take a stand for Christ, I can stand up for Christ with confidence that even when those forces of evil look unstoppable, that the victory belongs to God and to God's people. 
So I conclude this lesson and I conclude this study series with the same words and the same proclamation which Don closes his vision. As we pray together, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you and with all the saints. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful time and a wonderful day. And thank you for joining me in this lesson and throughout this series.